the scripture says without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins jesus spoke seven words or seven statements from the cross it doesn't matter what denomination you belong to what background you have been come, you have been going to while you were growing up if you take my case for instance i was i grew up in an anglican church and good friday was the day when you used to sit down for 3 hours in the church listening to probably nine sermons an introduction a conclusion and then the seven words and we'll all wait for that hot cross bun that they would give us at the end of the service a tradition that's been followed in several denominations it doesn't matter but if there is one thing that brings all the denominations together all the different beliefs or the interpretations of what the word of god says if there's one thing that should bring us all together is today we call it good friday but for those people who witnessed it on that very day it was black friday it was not good friday for them because their expectations were completely shattered they did not expect what happened to happen how many of us have been in situations where we expect certain things to happen and all our hopes have been thoroughly shattered but there is a time and there were three days after which this very thing that happened turned their world upside down and changed every human being especially those of them who were following Christ and they were called after the witness of what happened during resurrection they were called these are the people who have turned the world upside down it's because they witnessed the cross and they witnessed the resurrection and how wonderful for us to live in this time frame where we are reflecting after the event after what happened on the cross which all the patriarchs of the bible the whole old testament so many prophecies about what has to happen in order to redeem mankind into a relationship back with god because there was a huge wall that came up between humanity and god there was a bridge nobody had walked across that bridge nobody has walked across the bridge and that bridge was created by jesus on the cross so that humanity can pass from being sinful to becoming saints in Christ Jesus because Jesus becomes that crucial piece within that relationship i'm going to just go through the seven words of the cross i'm sure you have heard this many times not only in our church here but even maybe while you were growing up but i'm going to give you seven things that the cross offers to us what does the cross mean to us in this day and age or even for all purpose for all time what does the cross mean to people what does the cross mean to you is the cross a symbol of decoration that you can wear because the cross unites all the different people who believe in Christ Jesus has it become just a symbol of decoration or the cross means really something to you so if you look at the seven words that is captured by the four gospel writers of what Jesus said from the cross the words of a dying man how many of you all know that when a person is about to pass away you want to just listen to them and you want to do everything that that person wants of you just before they pass from earth to eternity how important that is for you many you don't don't you know that we always ask what were his last words what did he say did he say something 
And many people, they look at their loved ones and then they just, even if they're not able to mouth those words, they say that the look on their face says, I love you. And it is because of that love that God had for humanity that he put Jesus on the cross. And Jesus starts with this first words, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. So what's the first thing that the cross offers? The first thing that the cross offers is deliverance from sin. Deliverance from sin. If there is anything that should define humanity is sin. That is the condition of humanity. Because we know that when it, when it all first started, that's where the beliefs of people can be different. It all comes down to you and me recognizing who we are. And the cross, what does it offer? Deliverance from sin. And what stops people from coming to God? What stops people from recognizing that there is a God? It's that God looks at you and me and says, you are a sinner because the scripture says in Romans 3.23 and in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. The entire humanity has sinned. The fact that many people do not want to recognize God is because God deems you to be a sinner and you do not want to recognize that you are a sinner in need of saving grace. You and I think that you have something inside of us. How can somebody tell you that you have done something wrong? You think about it. If anyone comes to us and tells us that you have done something wrong, do you think it's easy? Do any one of us like to be told? Even by our own friends or family? We all want to be the perfect people. And here, as after he's been put on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Think about this with me. Did the people who put Jesus on the cross really did not know what they were doing? Did they in fact lose their mind? Were they hallucinating or something? Were they mentally deranged? Did they not have everything together? You think that there are people, like some people when, it, when they do certain things we can say, well, I mean, he's not got it all together. So whatever they do, we can just forgive them. But for people who know what they are doing and when they do it, what is it that you and I expect of them? You expect that they come back to you and they say, yes, I have done something wrong. But here, Jesus, even before they could ask, he's offering them forgiveness, deliverance from sin, saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. So the first thing that the cross offers is deliverance from sin. How do you understand sin? The scripture gives us two kinds, two concepts of sin. One is crossing a boundary, a line that is written, uh, a line that is drawn around you and that you do not cross. And there's a second idea of sin that the scripture gives, which is missing the mark. The first one is like a boundary that is written, uh, that is drawn around you. Meaning, we all know that certain things in life, for example, if you take, what is the boundary that is given to you when you're driving? Speed limit. It says 35. Or it says 55. But what does your spirit ask you to do when you see the 55 zone? You want to do like 60, 65, right? Or you want to do, if it's a 35 zone, you want to do 40 or 45. You want to give that, that 10 miles per hour range. Kind of you want to play around that. 
and we think that, okay, the police will let me off as long as I'm in the 10 MCH, and then if I go beyond that, he's going to get me. So there is a spirit, like missing the mark. So the first one is just that you can't go below 35. I mean, you can't go above 35 or above 55. You're complete, you're perfectly in control at 54. How many of you all drive like that? But what do you do? You go beyond, because there's kind of an unwritten rule in this country that says, if you go like 10 MPH, and especially sometimes if you're a woman, they let you go. But if you're a man, no grace. Absolutely. You are, you are judged on a very high scale. See, you miss the mark, still you miss the mark. I miss the mark. If I'm driving at 54, and even if the police did not, do not catch me, I have missed the mark. Because the mark tells me it's only 35, so there's a boundary that I've crossed, but still I have missed the mark. So it's like there are certain things that, I mean, when you cross a boundary, it is called sin. But even within that, when we go against a certain standard that God has placed for us, we have sinned. For example, the Old Testament says, you commit a murder when you kill somebody. Only when you kill somebody, you've committed a murder, literal murder. But in the New Testament, Jesus set a higher mark and said, if you are angry at your brother or your sister, you have committed murder. How many murderers are sitting here? If you have to look at the interpretation of what Jesus said, the standards that he has set for us, we miss the mark. We are sinners. And what Jesus offers from the cross is forgiveness, deliverance from sin. Secondly, the second word from the cross is this is what happened. There's a fantastic conversation. You know, Jesus always has destiny-defining conversations with people. And the second word from the cross is this. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. The second thing that Jesus offers, the cross offers to us is, first is deliverance from sin, second, he's offering you a relationship for eternity. A relationship for eternity. Because right here he says, the two people hanging on the cross, you know, many of us, we all, I think, if one of the characters that you would want us uh, or we can all, one of us can take, is the thief on the cross. Because you don't have to go through life. You don't have to go through life. You say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you shall be with me in paradise. And he's done and he's there forever with him. One of the people you'll definitely see on the side of heaven is that thief. Because God promised him eternity right there. A relationship with him because he recognized who God is. And he had the fear of God in contrast to the other thief who said, if you are God, you come down, you save yourself and save us. Prove yourself to me. But here, this guy said, don't you fear God? And then he says, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And he's immediately granted eternity for to be with Jesus forever. Deliverance from sin, relationship for eternity, and the third word from the the third word from the cross is a relationship with fellow human beings. A relationship with fellow human beings. 
what's happening here? This is what is happening. Jesus is on the cross. He sees his mother out there. Even though he is in so much of pain, he saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, and he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. He said, Love God. Right there at the second word of cross, the word from the cross, it's like loving God because you fear God, you love Him, and here immediately he offers a relationship saying, Love your neighbor as yourself. And here he is showing his mother, though I may not be there as a son for you, here is your son. And here is a mother. And what happens right here is, from that time on, this disciple, he did not go looking for an uh, old age home, where he can put his mother out there, take care of them. You know what he did? He took the mother into his own home. You know, there is something that Charles Stanley said. Years ago, I heard him after coming into this country. And I was surprised because I come from a culture where parents are respected. And even unto death, they are taken care of at home. They are part of the family. They're not sent out. And Charles Stanley said this. He said, if there is one thing that every Christian is supposed to do is to respect and care for their parents till their end. And you know, there are so many of us who come from different cultural backgrounds into this country, and we may not realize, I, I know that many, many of the people are struggling with that issue because they are brought here, and now they don't have that opportunity to take care of their parents. There is some kind of a struggle there. There is a pain that many of us go through because we are not given that, uh, that um, opportunity or we are not given that um, situation where we can easily do that. Taking care of one another in relationships. So the first thing that the cross offers is deliverance from sin. Second, a relationship for eternity with God. And third, a relationship with fellow human beings, starting with the family. And the fourth word from the cross. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. And he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? After speaking about the first three words, the last four words from the cross or the sayings from the cross, I'm going to say what the cross means to us. The first I said what the cross offers to us, which is deliverance from sin, relationship with God for eternity, and relationship with fellow human beings. But now I'm going to say what the cross means to us. The fourth word from the cross, taking off from what, Je what Jesus said, he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The cross means pain. The cross means pain. It's not just a symbol of desperation that we can hang on our neck or we can have it in our home just looking at it and say, It's so beautiful. There's nothing beautiful about the cross. It means pain. Because when he was hanging on the cross, he felt the pain of separation from his father and he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? How many of us, how many of you here seated are, have felt the pain of rejection, the pain of separation? The cross means pain. We can't get away from that. It's going to hurt you. There are going to be moments in life when things are going to be very tough. It's going to hurt you. And what do you do at that time? You can only cry out to God and say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Though in this, it doesn't mean that God had forsaken Christ. It's 
if the word of God says, even your mother and your father may disown you, but I will never forsake you. So do you think that God the Father actually forsook Jesus? He did not forsake him. It was that moment, there are moments in life when you feel that everything is falling apart. And Billy Graham said this, the Christian life is not a constant high. I have my moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, Oh God, forgive me or help me. The Christian life is not a constant high. There are moments of deep discouragement. And at that time, the only thing that you and I can do is not go seek out for a fellow human being as much as there are people around you who can come and help you. But more than that, the first response should be to go to your Father in heaven with tears and say, My God, oh God, forgive me or help me. Cross means pain. The fifth word from the cross. Later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. What does this mean? The cross means exhaustion. It's going to, life is going to exhaust you. It's going to drain you. Jesus was fully man and fully God and that is why as a man on the cross he was so thirsty because of the pain that he has already gone through through the flogging and the cursing everything that's been done he is thirsty his body is aching he's completely exhausted and he's expressing that exhaustion and he's saying I am thirsty and in order for the scripture to be fulfilled we know that the the people, they, the scripture says that wine and vinegar was given to him, dipped a sponge that was dipped and it was offered to him to just quench his thirst. The scriptures had already spoken about it. There are times that you're going to be exhausted. It is going to be, the cross means Truly following Christ means there are going to be moments when you're going to be exhausted, when you're going to be stretched to your ultimate. And you're going to say, God, I, can, I just want to give up. I'm thirsty. I, I can't do anything now. It's so draining. You can only tell him. The cross means pain. Cross means it's going to exhaust you. Following Christ certain days is going to be ex- is going to be as stressful, it's going to exhaust you. But you know, the sixth word from the cross gives us meaning because it said this. When he had received the drink, you know when there are moments of exhaustion in your life and when you receive from God whatever he gives you, maybe through fellow human beings or directly he comes and communes with you and he gives you that peace in your heart or that comfort that you need, You know what you would say? Like Jesus, he said, it is finished. The cross, the cross means fulfillment. See, he doesn't leave you hanging on the cross with pain and with exhaustion and says, that's how you're going to finish your life. No, it means fulfillment. Because as he was exhausted and he, after he finished the drink, Something happened in his body that he was able to say, it is finished. It is finished. Why? In John chapter 12, Jesus, when he was talking about his death, he's saying, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and it dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. And then a voice from heaven came and said, uh, said, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And then in his interaction with Pilate Pilate before going to the cross, 
Pilate tells him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. And then he tells, for this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Unless you have a purpose in life, you will be able to see, you will be able to say, when you're going through so much of pain, and when you're going through exhaustion, and at the end of it you will say, it is finished. There is a purpose. Why you are going through that pain? Why you are going through exhaustion? There is a purpose attached to it. You will be able to say, it is finished at the end. Because that is why God has created you. And Billy Graham said this, my one purpose in life is to help people find a personal relationship with God, which I believe comes from knowing Christ. He had only one purpose. Paul said, I have resolved to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Only one thing I want to know. And that's that one purpose of knowing Christ. The last word from the cross, the seventh word, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit, I commend my spirit. The cross means pain, exhaustion, fulfillment, and death. It means death. When the first disciples heard Jesus saying, unless you take up your cross daily and follow me, they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. Saying, Jesus was saying that you need to be ready to lay your life down. Because at that time, the cross was not a symbol of decoration. It was a symbol of death. The cross was not a symbol of decoration, but a symbol of death. The cross means pain, exhaustion, fulfillment, and death. And the cross offers deliverance from sin. A relationship with God for eternity and relation, relationship with fellow human beings. Have you really understood the place of the cross in your life? Would you be able to do it today as you respond to this word? Because there's one thing that Jesus said while he was on this earth. Do this in remembrance of me till I come. And that is what you and I are going to do in response today. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
night that Jesus went and he called his disciples together to celebrate one final time, to institute the very thing that we've come to know as communion. He said, do this in remembrance of me. On that night in which he approached that table, he had communion knowing that he was going to come to the cross. The cross is an amazing and horrible instrument of torture. When we think about the agony upon which Jesus suffered, as was just spoken, as we reviewed these seven statements from the cross, I can't help but put in our remembrance before we come to communion tonight that specifically there at the cross, and while Jesus was there, each and every wound that Jesus received was received so that you and I could receive a blessing. I'll never forget the first time I read Samuel Moharaj's book, The Power and the Purpose of the Wounds of Jesus. It's amazing when we think about what it says in Matthew 27. And I'm just going to quickly read that when the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the praetorium, they gathered the garrison around Jesus. You talk about being surrounded. And there they stripped him and put a scarlet robe upon him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed their knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. This was not the customary practice if you would observe other Roman crucifixions that other criminals would wear a crown of thorns. These aren't like the little raspberry thorns when you pick raspberries. These were nail-like thorns. And when you think about their hardness and, and how sharp they were, they wove them into a crown to mock Jesus. And when we think about this, Satan thought he was mocking Jesus, but the wound that he was inflicting upon Jesus was actually a fulfillment that was given from the book of Genesis that the curse that he had put on man was represented in that crown, the crown of thorns, because the ground had been cursed. Do you remember that? And out of the ground, man would toil. And those of us that love gardening know that we hate thorns. And yet the thorns were woven around the head of Jesus, and they were there to represent the symbol of the curse that he was about to break. The curse that had started from so long ago that out of the ground those thistles and thorns would grow. Reminding us even of Jesus' words when he said there was a sower that went out to sow a good seed. Remember? And he said some of them fell along the wayside and some there the birds came down and snatched up. But some of the good seed fell where? Among thorns not by happenstance when we think about how supernatural the Bible is and how amazing it is that in every way through Jesus' suffering, he answered and, and has provided an answer to the curse. And there they mocked him saying, are you truly a king? Therefore they put a crown on his head and indeed he was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When we think about how Satan mocked him and when we think about how that curse of sin, he took it upon himself, the very curse that we deserve, Jesus put it upon his head, and they thrust it down upon his head. So deeply can you imagine each and every thorn that pressed itself upon our Savior's brow. Never once does the scripture say that the crown was ever removed for the entirety of his time there on the cross. Now these, the Bible tells us, 
when you're speaking of the parable of the sower that some were sown among the thorns, we remember that those who have fallen to the thorns remind us of those who have fallen to the cares of the world through this thing called worry. And even through the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things that eventually come around us and choke the very word, and therefore it becomes unfruitful. When we think about this, how many times we fall prey to the worries of our own thoughts. And Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast thy burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Hallelujah. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. And so think about that. As they thrust that crown upon his head, blood flowed out. The very answer that cancels the curse. The blood of Jesus can cancel the curse of worry and the very things that symbolizes the things that will choke the very life from us. Jesus spilt his own blood, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world. Think about each and every wound that was upon Jesus we're reminded about the wounds that were there on his back. The Bible says in John 19, 1, that Pilate took Jesus and scourged him with a, with a tremendous whipping that took place. If you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ, I watched that and I just saw an amazing... How could anyone ever endure such a beating? How could anyone ever endure such wounds as those were, that were inflicted for Jesus? But the Bible tells us that specifically the wounds that he received on his back, as Isaiah even prophesied, they were for our punishment. By his wounds, our punishment has been canceled. It was for our peace that Jesus received the lashes, each and every single one of us, to cleanse us of a guilty conscience. Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, For he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. I love this. It also says that each and every wound that was upon Jesus' back was for our healing. Don't we claim that each and every time we come together as a church? That it is what? By his we are healed. So think about that. Those wounds upon his back were for your healing. Hallelujah. And some may be here tonight that need to claim that. You can claim that because of the blessed wounds of Jesus that he received upon his body for your sins and for your healing. Each and every lash of the whip that struck against his tender flesh reminds us of our own deliverance as slaves to sin he broke the power of sin, that we are no longer going to be slaves. He took the beating that we deserve for our sins. As Galatians 4, 5 through 7 says, To redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, whereby we can cry, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Who could forget those tremendous nails that each soldier took as they stretched them there upon the cross? Each nail, one for each wrist, one for his feet. And Jesus took the blessed wounds upon his hands and feet. And think about those powerful, uh, those images of the, of the soldiers nailing him there. I love what Max Lucado said. It wasn't the nails that held him, but it was his love that held him there. Think about that. Each and every wound that Jesus had was an answer upon which he would bring provision. Think about those hands of Jesus that he touched the blind, he touched the sick, he touched those that were oppressed. Think about the hands of Jesus that brings us our provision each and every day, our daily bread. Think about the hands of Jesus there when Peter was going under, that the hand of Jesus was the hand that reached down and rescued Peter, and the same hand reached down and rescued every single one of us. Oh, Satan thought the nails could hold Jesus there on the cross, but it was those very nails that pierced the hands that would bring us blessing. Think about the feet of Jesus. The Bible says that wherever Jesus went about, wherever he traveled, he did good. 
John 21, verse 25, it says, There were also many other things that Jesus did, which, of which they were written one by one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written about it. Finally, the ancient promise, when we think about what was being fulfilled there on the wounds of Jesus' feet, started not there in, uh, in Gethsemane, but they went back to the Garden of Eden when the curse fell. And he said, there would come a seed that would be born of a woman. And though the serpent would strike his heel, he would crush his head. Hallelujah. Those wounds in the feet of Jesus remind us that he would be victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And finally, the wound that would come from his side as one of the soldiers looked upon him and said, surely this was the Son of God. And as Jesus breathed his last and he cried with a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit as he said, no man takes my life from me, but I willingly lay it down. And to just be certain that he was truly dead, the soldier took the spear and thrust it into his side, and out from his side came water and blood. Some say that Jesus died there on the cross of a broken heart. There is a, literally a physical condition that happened as those long hours pursued there on the cross, Jesus heaving and, and, and struggling for every breath. It's believed that fluid would literally build around the human heart so that water and blood would flow out from his side. What an amazing God that it was through the very last drop of blood that flowed out of Jesus, it sealed for us an eternal and an everlasting covenant, one that is superior to the old covenant and one that will remain eternal with God forever. Hallelujah. The last drop of blood that flowed out of Jesus sealed forever the covenant that has given, been given to us through his blood. Isn't it amazing? I stand in awe of Jesus. And I just want to take this moment. I want you to bow with me in this moment. And I want you to reflect upon each and every wound that Jesus bore upon himself. He did so willingly because he substituted himself for us. Such amazing love. It's so incomprehensible. It's so amazing. And you know, as you bow your heads here tonight, some of us may be seated here and your life right now is experiencing a pain, whether it's a sickness, whether it's the loss of something or someone. The pain that we experience in life from defeated dreams, the pain that we feel in life because of desertion or others, the pain that we can identify when, when all we have tried and we still do not succeed. If there's one thing my God can identify with us is our pain because he chose to substitute himself for us. What an amazing confidence we can have and have here in our hearts here tonight that God understands our human pain. He understands our hurt, and not just the wounds in our body, He understands the hurt of our hearts. He understands the deepest longing of our soul. He understands our frustration. He understands our difficulties. He understands our rejection. He understands how many times we've tried to do better and when we fall short. He understands our pain and he understands our shame and the things that we would not be proud of to utter that we have done. And all of those things that God can identify the most with in the human life, he understands our pain. And he has provided an answer for it because he offered himself for us. Oh, let's give him praise tonight. Let's give him honor tonight. Let's give him glory tonight. Oh, Father, we thank you for the blessed wounds of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you for each and every promise that you have given, Lord. 
We thank you, God, for your covenant, Lord. A covenant that cannot be broken. Hallelujah. A covenant that is eternal and sealed by blood. Hallelujah. A covenant that Satan can't defy. A covenant that no demon in hell can, can break. Hallelujah. There is no power on earth or in heaven that can break that holy covenant. It is eternal. It is secure. It is everlasting. It is stronger now than ever and will never lose its power. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the pressing that you received. Through every press of the press that you received, Lord, you have given us your redeeming love. Every pressing that you received, Lord, it was for love. Hallelujah. It was for grace, Lord. It was for the forgiveness of our sins. It was a new and living way that you opened up for us that we can become your sons and daughters. Oh, praise his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you give him glory for that this, this evening? I want us to take these moments and think on these things. He said, do these in remembrance of me. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, the Bible says he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it. He said, I'm not going to drink of the cup of this new covenant again until I drink it in the kingdom of God, pointing to the time of his return. This cup, is the covenant of his eternal blood. Every drop of his blood was poured out for our forgiveness and the remission of our sins. For as it was said before, without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. And that same night, Jesus also took bread Thinking about this, in his earthly life, he said, I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. Jesus said, we can't live. Not one moment of any day without the true living bread. Men can't live without bread, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So when Jesus blessed the bread, and the Bible says that he broke it. Hallelujah. He gave thanks to God. Can you think about thanking God when you were betrayed? Hallelujah. Only amazing love. Only God can do that. Only one whose love is perfect. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to invite you tonight to participate with us in communion. And I'm going to invite you in just a few moments. We're going to form two lines. One on the right of the table and one on the left. And as you come, I'm going to invite you to take a piece of bread and take a cup. And as you come down the center aisle, I want you to go out on the side aisles. That way we can, no traffic jams here. <laughs> but we want to we want to participate. His love ran red. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So I challenge you tonight as you come to receive this bread and you, as you come to receive this cup, the Bible says you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Would you bow with me as we bless these emblems together? Father, it's in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Father, we thank you, God, that Jesus was willing to substitute himself for us. We thank you, Lord, that it was by your stripes that we are healed. We thank you that, Lord, it was your love that held you to the cross. God, we thank you that the curse of worry and the curse of sin and the curse of death and the curse of the grave has been denied 
because you willingly offered yourself and the blood of your covenant is superior to that of the blood of bulls and rams and goats and every other sacrifice that was before it. For your blood takes away our sin. Your blood cancels our punishment. Your blood makes us no longer slaves, but sons and daughters of the living God. And so, Lord, it's with gratefulness now that we're about to receive the emblems of your broken body and the emblem of your shed blood. We ask your blessing upon each one that receives it now in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to come right out to the center aisle. Come right ahead and receive the bread and receive the cup. Oh, what a Savior. What an amazing God. Willingly, He came. Oh, we thank you for the victory, Lord. Thank you for the deep cleansing, Lord. Thank you that it's through your blood that we are forgiven and sins washed clean. Hallelujah. Oh, praise His name. Give Him glory tonight. Hallelujah. It's the blessedness of your wounds, Jesus, that cancels the curse. Hallelujah. The blessedness, Lord, of your patience, your long-suffering, your kindness, your goodness, your gentleness, Lord, your amazing love, O oh Lord. You shower us with kindness, O oh God. You do not return, Lord, insults, but you shower us with amazing love. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a mighty God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, we praise you. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. We exalt you, oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It may be Good Friday, but Lord, some can relate, Jesus, that maybe there are things that are going wrong in their lives, Lord. Maybe there is incredible pain and agony. Maybe the situations that we've come through look impossible or seem difficult. But God, they only remind us that the third day is coming. Hallelujah. Early on Sunday morning, oh God, we thank you that it was then that you rose from the dead triumphant. Father, we pray your blessing upon each and every person here tonight. We thank you that, God, you love us with such an amazing love that you were not willing that any one of us would perish, but that all would come to repentance through the knowledge of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For, God, you did not come into the world to condemn the world, but the world through you might be saved. God, we pray that each and every single one of us would know that we're saved, live our lives as one who has been set free. God, we know that your word says, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You set captives free. You set the slaves of Israel free that they might serve you, O oh God. May we serve you, Lord, with gladness of heart. May we serve you with joy. And with expectancy, Lord, that you're coming again. 
Lord, may we be about your business. Lord, help us to share this love with others, Lord. Help us to make you shine in our lives, Lord. May we decrease. May you increase, Lord. Let your light shine in us that the world may know thou hast sent the Son. Father, unite us by your precious blood. Father, we cancel every assignment that the enemy would have against us, our families, against this church, against your people, Lord, against, Lord Jesus, the plans and purposes that you have ordained. We are your workmanship in Christ Jesus, created for good works. Help us to serve you diligently. Help us to serve you faithfully. Help us to love one another. Lord, help us in our going out and our coming in, Lord. Surround us with your mighty angels, almighty God. Go with us, Lord, tonight and bring us again safely, we ask. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Praise his name. Hallelujah.